Well, hello everyone. Looks like we're up to 18 to 20 people. Just wanted to uh, say hello to everyone and welcome you. My name is Chris Miller. I'm in the development and philanthropy group at the Lab of Ornithology. So I'm in Ithaca, New York. And I'd like to welcome you to the, uh, the follow on to the Gardening for Birds webinar that we just had. Hope most of you were able to attend and listen to that. Um, we have a, a few guests. Uh, we have a few experts doing a, a panel uh, that's specifically for Morvan uh, members and will have a focus on the New Jersey area. Um, but I'd like to turn it over to Lisa Ullman uh, just to uh, tee us up a bit more. Lisa's a, uh, a, a chairman's council member at the Lab of Ornithology and uh, also I think chairs the education uh, committee at the Morvan Museum. So she was the, the person who suggested to us that we do something together and I appreciate that. Uh, Lisa's also a, a Cornell alumnus, but I just wanna mention most of the people we welcome uh, to the lab as members are, are not Cornell alums. So we, we welcome and encourage everybody who's interested to join us. So Lisa, over to you. Okay, well, um, welcome everyone. As Chris said, I have been privileged to be involved at, on the um, chairman's committee or what, um, on the Lab of O, which my husband gave me my Lab of O shirt last year for my birthday. I work with Debbie on the education committee at Morven, which is amazing. And so when we were doing, which is our current exhibition, the Hardenberg, um, exhibit and Hardenberg, Gerard Rutgers Hardenberg was an ornithologist um, who actually did a lot of paintings and bird art and Debbie can say more. I thought, oh, we really have to connect the Lab of O and Morven. So hence, this is a program and I'm very excited because um, I love my garden and I can't wait to learn more to bring more birds to my garden. So now I think, am I passing it on to Debbie? Yes, you are. Yeah, thank you so much, Lisa. My name is Debbie Lampert Rudman. I'm the curator of education and public programs at Mortimer Museum and Garden in Princeton. And we are overjoyed to be uh, collaborating thanks to Lisa's Cornell connections with the Cornell Lab of Ornithology. And as she mentioned, I just have a little little promo thing here for our In Nature's Realm, the art of Gerard Rutgers Hardenberg. Um, so we're all about birds right now and we are doing everything we can to um, attract birds and bird lovers to Morvan uh, now through the beginning of January. So I'm super excited. I mean, I, I recognize a lot of names in our um, little chat list here, um, but we do hope that you will put any questions you have in the chat for our speakers um, this afternoon. And I'm just looking to see, um, I, I do see a number of um, members of Morvan and we do hope you'll become a member of the Cornell Lab of Ornithology as well. So I think I now pass it on to our speakers um, and I will just say how thankful we are to have Becca and Marla with us. May I interject one thing? Go Sorry, Becca. Um, Go ahead. The, um, oh, I was going to say, it would, it's not a very large group today. Um, so anyone who, uh, who wants to turn their camera on at any point, we of course love seeing faces, but we also understand um, a lot of times people prefer to listen. Um, and if you'd like to put in the chat uh, at some point, just where you're from in New Jersey, uh, you know, just a hello so other people can see who you are, that would be wonderful. Thanks a lot. Over to you, Becca. Yeah, thanks, Chris. Um, I think Marla and I are both excited to be here and to work with you all to answer your questions. That's kind of one of the nice things of ha about having these small breakout groups is that we have an opportunity to be more intimate. So I encourage um, people to conversate. Um, and neither Marla nor I are growing in New Jersey. And I bet many of you on this call are, many of you have gardens. So I would, um, uh, Marla and I will answer questions, but let's answer each other's questions too. This is an opportunity for us to have a conversation. And those of you that are in that region have even probably more insight than what Marla and I will offer. 
Um, and I think Marla, I invite her to introduce herself, but I think Chris and Debbie, you guys were going to kind of help facilitate what questions you'd like us to sort of start and, and carry on with. Is that true? Yes, I'm, I'm uh, monitoring the chat and right now I see there are a couple of questions already in there. So I figured once you have your intro, I don't know how many people here have you know, been part of the noon program. So we can riff off of some of those points. But yeah, there are some questions coming into the chat and I'll, I'll field those. So Marla, do you want to yeah. introduce yourself? Yeah, that's, I was just waiting. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Hi, I'm Marla Copolino. I work at the Lab of Ornithology's Bird Academy unit, and we create online courses that you can purchase own forever and go at your own pace. The most recent course we just released is called Growing Wild, Gardening for Birds and Nature. So it sounds like it's right up your alley. We talk about native plants and how to mimic natural habitat in your backyard and how to support the birds in a natural way. Thank you. Um, I, I, if you'd like, I can get started with the first questions here. Um, and this is to either, either or both of you, whoever wants to answer. Um, what are some of the best plants and habitats for hummingbirds? Sure, I can start us off there. Um, there's lots of options for hummingbirds. Um, and one of the resources, if you guys don't know about this resource is um, the Pollinator Partnership. Um, in addition to the course that I definitely encourage you all to take, but the Pollinator Partnership has these really beautiful guides that you can download. And before the talk, I was actually um, exploring with some New Jersey zip codes. And it looks like the vast majority of the zip codes are in the Eastern broadleaf forest. So I'm gonna probably talk a lot about the plants in that eco region, if you're wondering what I'm referencing. And the URL for that, if you're interested in looking it up is just pollinator.org. Um, and they have, you have the capacity to drop in your zip code. Um, and I'll actually put it in the chat here. You can drop your zip code in um, and search for your region and it'll provide you with lots of plants and it'll tell you things like like what to plant for hummingbirds. Um, but off the cuff, uh, right now in my gardens, Columbine is feeding my hummingbirds. Um, they're coming right in and feeding right up um, next to my windows, which a lot of my Columbine is. Um, there's lots of hybrids of Columbine. So um, I don't know specifically about sort of the nectar quantity and quality of all Columbines, but there is a native version of the Columbine, which is kind of an orangish with a yellow flower center. That is your, your native. Um, and then, of course, there's lots of cultivars. But um, if you can find columbine, that's a great one. Um, flowering in the middle of the summer, I um, attract a lot of them with uh, cardinal flower. And that's a very tall red flower that comes up. It's great for really wet soils. For those of you that maybe have wetland areas or really wet uh, clay soils, beautiful flower. And ironically enough, in the promo video for the garden course, um, they actually got a, a hummingbird on cardinal flower when they came out to fill my property. So they love that plant, highly recommend it. Um, and then I'll throw one more out there, the um, coral honeysuckle. Um, I love this. It's just about to start flowering in my yard. Um, this is one that you need to have climbing for. So I have it climb up an archway that I have in my garden. Um, but the, the hummingbirds love it. And it's got an incredibly long flowering cycle. So columbine is, it'll come, it'll go. Cardinal flower, it'll come in and go. But the coral honeysuckle flowers almost the entire season where I'm at. And I, I foresee that's probably true down where you are. So those are three plants. And I, I believe all of those are listed in the, um, the pollinator guide, which I provided that, that link for you all. Thank you so much, Becca. Um, so, oops, we're just looking here. Um, unless Marla had anything more to add to that. Um, she covered you? all the ones that I was going to say. Uh, Cardinal flower, that's Monarda, no? No, no. Oh, it's not. The Lobelia, yeah. Lobe that's right. Um, um, uh, Monarda comes in, is a few species of it. Uh, um, common name is bee balm and the hummingbirds like that. I've got a couple of different varieties of monarda in my native garden and I'm waiting for them to bloom. They're new to me. 
Thank you for that. Um, I, someone put a note in here, always visit Cornell Sapsucker Woods every time we went back to Ithaca. So there's a little thumbs up for the Ithaca visit. Um, next question here, uh, in the last um, Zoom you just did, when you mentioned having running water, what are some suggestions of ways to have that in a typical backyard? Um, I can answer the, the easy, cheap version that requires no electricity or anything fancy. <laughs> you can um, suspend a, a gallon water jug and put a little pinprick hole at the bottom, hang that in whatever, a tree or, or a support of some sort and have your bird bath below it and it will drip drip, drip and make little ripples and birds are drawn to moving water like a magnet. So those work really well. Uh, these days there's all kinds of other pumps that you could submerge into your regular bird bath. There are even floating devices that work off solar power and create a little fountain. I've heard varying degrees of whether those actually uh, work for more than a week. <laughs> Um, but uh, they're commercially available. Those are all easy ways to do it. And some people go for go all out. I've seen people who have these elaborate pumps that make a little waterfall and birds love it. I've, I've been truly impressed by how many different species that you'd normally never see in your yard. Uh, ruby crowned kinglets and um brown thrashers everybody comes for water so that's a really easy way to draw in birds but like i said like the 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 cheap and easy version is just put a jug up and uh, have the um just a water dripping into what's below it is a good way the other idea is never to have a bird bath be deep uh, we want to mimic a puddle a puddle so think of a puddle outside and you have all we've all seen birds drink and play and wash themselves in puddles. So it, it does not need to be deep and it shouldn't be deep. Thank you, Marla, that's, that's great. Becca, do you have anything to add? Yeah, um, I think Marla's suggestion of the jug is a great one. And I was just gonna put a pitch in there for those that have children or grandchildren or young people in their lives. It's a fun art project to do. Um, if you can get a bunch of jugs and, and paint them and decorate them and then fill them with water and put them in the, the garden, it adds fun, um, a fun decoration. I've been playing with that a lot this year. I have a lot of very beautiful established flower gardens and I've been playing with art and adding art and dimension to my garden, which is almost just as fun as adding new flowers that add color and dimension. So, um, you know, have fun with your art projects. And I will speak to the solar pump. Um, I got one that, you know, wasn't the top of the line and it wasn't the bottom of the line. Um, and I had it in my bird bath. It was a solar pump and it didn't work great. So um, it is it is kind of easy to just do the jug or if you're going to invest in a pump, I do recommend that you do some deep research and um, if you can manage it, try and get something that's pretty good. Um, I think the next thing that my husband and I are going to try, we're going to try and build a, a fountain because we both are very into art and, um, and the wildlife. So we're going to use a fountain um, design structure that kind of will have some natural tiering effects. So the water will be able to move a little bit with just gravity. And then we're going to put a base pump in that will pump it back up to the top. Um, so something like that, if you wanted to go big and create different layers, birds like to feed or, and drink water at different layers too. So I think about that too, like, um, you know, juncos and some of your um, thr thrushes and stuff will want to drink closer to the ground. Um, they'll be more of your song song, middle story birds, chickadees, cardinals, et cetera, that are gonna to wanna to feed at a little higher level and then sometimes even higher than that. So putting water at different layers is also, and levels is also a, diff, a great idea to feed lots and, or provide water for lots of different types of birds. Thank you, Becca. Those were, both of you, fantastic ideas. I've never thought of like any of them. <laughs> I have a bird bat, that's it. Um, and so next question here, what are some ways to prevent birds from crashing into windows? Yeah, we talked about that um, a little bit in the last one and Marla, please jump in. Um, so I will tell you what I think is one of the best resources for this. It's um, ABC and let me, this is the nice thing about um, bird conservation. Um, 
this is one of the nice things about being on a small uh, talk, but they have probably the most, um, I'll drop it into chat in just a second, the most elaborate uh, description of your different options for Windows. And Windows is really kind of up there with an, an aesthetic choice and what you will find works for you. Um, but certainly protecting Windows is incredibly important. Um, when I gave a talk recently, I provided some pictures. Some people create um, art on their windows, either with paint or sticky notes to detract. Um, and I should back up. The, when birds look in your windows, like if you go outside your house and you're trying to figure out which windows are going to be the most alluring um, to birds, they see what we see. So if you look back at your windows and you see a beautiful tree with some sky, that's exactly what the birds see. And that's why birds collide with windows is because they think literally that that reflection that we recognize as a reflection is not a reflection, but actually a tree in clouds and they're gonna fly right into it. So that's why birds do this. And so anything that will minimize that or disrupt that. And ABC talks about two inches, whatever you do, like if you use strings or you use taping, um, if you use decals, you want to put them so there's about a two inch space in between, um, which is not a lot, um, but birds really need to have their vision broken broken up in order to recognize that that window, beautiful window scene is not actually a, a beautiful scene that they can fly into. So I'll pull up that link. Marla probably has other ideas from her um, coursework that she wants to throw in there. Yeah, um, I'll just say briefly uh, that link provides tons of information, but um, some people are hesitant to put decals or, or things like that on the window. There's some easy thing you can do, which I've done, and it really seems to be helping with one particular window. I've had some collisions uh, is uh, on a double stick, uh, hang um, string, a uh, string that's visible and tie uh, long pieces of string two inches apart and, and um, space them. It's <laughs> sort of akin to a beaded curtain from the, the uh, psychedelic times. <laughs> but um, You could put beads on it if you want, but I used a string and, you, and then you put that on the inside of your window and it breaks up the pattern a bit. So you don't have to necessarily put adhesives on your window. Those are great, great, great suggestions. Thank you. And yeah, we go back to um... Was it macrame? Start making macrame the hanging on the window. Um, so here's an interesting one. Um, it kind of ties in. What's the best distance from the window for bird feeder and the optimum number of feeders we should have? Should you try for a variety of birds at the feeders or should you specialize? Uh, I'll start. Um, the optimum distance for, through uh, trials and research seems to be three feet. You wanna keep the feeders within three feet of the window. And what a nice thing that is for us because we can, you know, if you have a chair, if you're a sofa, you're sitting in front of that window, perfect. You've got your view right there. There are a lot of types of bird feeders that uh, uh, have suction cups and stick right onto the window. And those are good too. The whole idea is that the bird isn't getting momentum in its flight to make what could be a fatal crash. If it does hit your window, it's at a very close range and it's not gonna be hurt. Uh, so that's the best idea. Any other feeders that you have, far away. There's no set distance for that, but you wanna keep them farther away. Um, as far as how many bird feeders to have, uh, I don't know. Uh, we seem to get more every year at my property here and we just keep adding them on. Uh, sometimes it's also uh, a challenge to find ones that the squirrels can't um, uh, finagle their way into. <laughs> so <laughs> there are nice bird feeders out there now that, that can uh, close up when the squirrel is on it because it's too heavy. Anything else, anything else, Becca? No, I think that's great. Thank you. Um... So you should, so should you try for a variety of birds at the feeders or is it important to specialize in that, you know, the little birds versus the big birds, the songbirds versus the, you know, more active, bigger birds, does it matter? Um, oh, oh, go ahead. Well, that, I mean, I was going to dive back into the, the gardening for birds, right? So um, we can always support birds and supplement any diet with seed. But if we want to really see a variety of birds, 
like warblers, um, um, uh, indigo buntings, the, the ones that you might not normally see, that's where having a native habitat that you're supporting and growing native plants and an abundance of native plants in your yard is going to make all the difference for bringing in different species. Yeah, I, I second that, Marla. I think feeders are wonderful and I do feed birds mostly just in the winter. I don't generally feed them this time of year because there is just so much to eat. Um, but really creating habitat for birds is gonna be your year round best food source. Um, if you're gonna do feeders, I think the general rule of thumb is uh, the sun black sunflower seeds provides probably the best seed in terms of what the birds tend to like. Um, so, uh, and that's across range. So even smaller um, finches will eat black sunflower seeds. Um, the Niger seed is also very good for some of the smaller beak. Um, birds if you wanted to use feeders as well. Um, and then I will just say for hummingbirds, since we did have a hummingbird question, one of the things that I um, think is a critical, um, and most people that are feeding hummers at this point know this, but you really don't want to use red dye hummingbird um, food. Absolute no-no. Um, there's nothing beneficial about that dye. I also don't have any science to point to that it's dangerous, so I can't argue that point, but it's not necessary. You just need a sugar water solution. Um, and I think that's a two to one ratio generally, correct me if I'm wrong on that Marla, I believe it's a two to one um, sugar water solution. And so two cups of water to one cup of sugar. And you want to change that, especially in this weather that's happening right now in the summertime, you wanna change that every three to five days um, because the sugar water can develop um, uh, bacteria and organisms that could be dangerous to our hummingbirds. So if you're going to do hummingbird feeding with a feeder, um, keep it clean like you would your own feeders at home. Your bird feeders, I recommend people cleaning every week to 10 days. So your actual seed feeders, you don't have to uh, clean as often, um, but those hummingbird feeders stay on top of that because birds can get sick on them. Oh, good points, Becca. I want to say to you, yeah, if you leave your, uh, your hummingbird feeders out too long, especially if they're getting sun, uh, it ferments and we don't want to intoxicate our little tiny hummingbirds. Um, you could even, if it even smells, starts to smell like alcohol, definitely time to change that. Um, the typical recipe is one part sugar and four parts water, I believe. That's, that's what I've been using. And, um, I just uh, do it on the stovetop. I, I heat up water, not to boiling, but just to get it warm and then pour in the sugar and mix it, let it cool. And then I put it in a glass container that I can have in the refrigerator ready for refills. And then definitely, definitely clean. And um, just your dish soap, nice antibacterial soap and water is good. You want to take a brush and clean the inside of it. And you also want to clean the parts that they perch in as well as the little feeder parts that they put their beaks in. Thank you so much. That's some great, great information. Um, so now this kind of ties in. Is there a one size fits all great native plant for New Jersey that would attract a lot of different birds? I mean, that's kind of an, you know, big, a wide ranging question, but I, I guess you could answer with more than one, but a one size fits all great native plant for New Jersey attracts a lot of different birds. I will throw some ideas out. I definitely don't have a one size fits all, but I'll answer this in a couple of different um, ways. Everybody on this call, I'm sure, has a different size space. So that always matters, right? Um, you know, can you put a tree in? Uh, is a tree going to be not realistic for you? Can you put in a shrub? Can you put in a flower? So, um, when I answer that question, it's hard because I don't know exactly what kind of space you're working with. But assuming that you have a decent amount of space, at least a, a yard of some sort, um, trees are really your go-to for the long haul for birds um, and specifically oak trees. And this is based on Doug Ptolemy's work. Um, if any of you are deep into learning and getting really intimate with this information, please check out his um, his books. His most recent one is actually all about oaks. And I think Marla is in the process. There it is right there. Bring Nature Home is one of his originals. Um, and then he's got um, two more that have followed. The most recent one is about oaks. So oak trees are an amazing um, 
Thank you, Marla. She's showing all the titles. Uh, oak trees are an amazing addition that's going to help all bird species. And that's from the big seed eating um, benefits of those trees. The, the acorns that oaks produce are consumed um, by jays and other large build um, birds. Uh, sometimes even nuthatches will actually eat acorns, even though they're, they're a smaller bird. Um, and then most importantly, Oak trees support the most caterpillar and moth larvae. And you may ask yourself, why is that important um, for New Jersey as a big bang for your birds? Well, it's because 96% of the songbirds that you have in New Jersey are gonna need those caterpillars and moth in order to raise more babies. Um, so they may not eat insects year round, but they're gonna eat insects during that important breeding period. And they're gonna feed those insects to their offspring. And the heavier and fatter and healthier those baby birds are, the bigger your bird population is going to be. And that's up to 96% of our birds that, um, that need those caterpillars. So oak trees are a great option. Some of your coastal properties, you probably can grow scrub oak, I know is native and it's very resistant to salt spray. So those of you that maybe live close to the coast in New Jersey, you could consider smaller versions of oak like scrub oak or chinkapin oak. Again, oak species in general is a great go-to. Um, and if that's not an option, trees and shrub, uh, bigger shrubbery isn't an option, look at some of your smaller shrubs. So your nine bark, your um, red osier dogwood, which I have pictured here, um, viburnums, any kind of a viburnum species. Again, the reason is they support lots of caterpillars and moth larvae. They produce a flower, as you can see here in the spring, which feeds lots of insects and birds. Um, that are nectar uh, consumers, and then they produce a fruit or a, a, some kind of a fall food source. So if you're thinking for bang for buck, think about a plant that can provide resources maximally across your growing period um, based on the size that you're working with. Thank you. We're all going to run out and get an oak tree right now. That was, that's incredible. Marla, what, what do you want to your audio just cut off, but I think you asked me to respond. Yes, I'm um, sorry. What would you like to add? Yeah. <laughs> um, well, uh, I didn't say this in my introduction, but I actually grew up in New Jersey and I lived there for the first 16 years of my life. And one of my first introductions to native plants was on Sandy Hook. Uh, it, it, um, I was amazed to learn about the native hollies there. They're growing in this sandy soil. Um, they're quite happy there, and they are really the basis of uh, the habitat of the birds that go through there. Hollies provide uh, berries uh, for birds and also shelter and cover. And um, if, if you live in some of the coastal areas, those types of plants that are suited to the climate and the uh, um, the salty sea air, uh, hollies are great. Um, it's also important to remember, it's so hard for, we, it's very hard for, for us, impossible really to give a one size fits all for a plant, but um, I encourage everybody to figure out um, which growing zone you're in, which your hardiness zone. So uh, um, in our course, we talk about using eco-region information <clears throat> and plant hardiness zone hand in hand. You need both. And New Jersey has uh, four hardiness zones in it from 6A, 6B, 7A, 7B. So depending on where you are, uh, if you use our course, you'll, you'll see the map, but you can just go on the plant hardy, um, sorry, the, um, uh, the USDA eco region map. I'll try to get a link into the chat to figure that out. And also your, um, sorry, did I say hardiness zones are 6A to 7B and then your eco regions, uh, there are two. One is Eastern temperate forests and the other is Northern forests. And, I, and then within them, there's a lot of diversity in New Jersey. I have family who live down by the Pine Barrens in Southern New Jersey. And then um, Cape May has <laughs> some of its own unique attributes and, and habitats too. Uh, so um, learn a bit about your area is very important to find the plants that are going to go grow best there for you. Uh, there's also the New Jersey Native Plant Society. I, will, uh, I can also put that in the chat. What's the best way to do that? Should I just throw these links into the chat? 
yes, you can just type right into the chat and then that'll be there for those um, when we send out the recording. Okay, um, great. I'll do that now. Thank you, Marla. Who knew you were a Jersey girl? There you go. Well, originally I've moved around so much. I've lived overseas. I've lived in different parts of the U.S., but I, I still have family, aunts and uncles who live in New Jersey. And um, it's always when I visit there and touch the soil, it, it does evoke some feelings of home. Yep. Once a Jersey girl, always a Jersey girl. That's it. Um, so thank you for that. And now the next question I have here, is there a specific bee balm I should plant? The red one or the purple one? Good question, both. <laughs> and they look beautiful planted together. Um, that's what I, I just recently put in a new Menarda. Menarda is the Latin beginning of, of the um, bee balms. Um, and I mixed them so that when they come in and flower, we get both. So the two that are the most popular and common um, that are as close to the true wild type as you can probably find at nurseries is the Oswego tea. That's the really bright red one. Um, and it, they both flower about the same time. The In my gardens, at least, the Oswego tea is a little bit later than the Medarda, I think it's Fistulosa. I think that's how you pronounce it. I, I generally keep it more into to the common names. That one's usually generally called uh, bee balm. Um, instead of the Oswego tea, it's called bee balm. And that one's kind of a lavender. That one has been highly hybridized. So you can sometimes get it in bright pink fuchsia kind of colors and sometimes darker purple colors. So it's been um, cultivated to have different colors. Um, but if you can find sort of the true sort of light lavender color, that's probably as close to your wild type um, that you can find. So plant both of those. Um, and Marla, have you had any others of the Menarda family that you like? Those are exactly the two that I have, <laughs> Monarda Fistulosa and, and uh, the Oswego team Monarda. Yeah. Great, that was wonderful information. Um, so now here's a little personal question. How, Becca and Marla, how did you each become interested in the study of birds? Any recommendations for someone interested in pursuing career in birds? Uh, gosh. I, um, I guess I'll start. <laughs> um, it, it start by being curious. Um, uh, we talk a lot in the lab of ornithology about having a spark moment. What was this one moment that you had an encounter with a bird or observed a bird that just sparked it in you and made you go, wow, <clears throat> that is just blow, blowing my mind. Um, you know, talking for younger people, take as many science courses as you can, and uh, especially at the earlier, at the um, undergraduate level, be sure you're taking good general biology courses, of course. Um, take your uh, ecology courses. Um, and then as you uh, reach your junior, senior year, there's gonna be more specialized courses for you. Uh, there's so many areas that you could enter into ornithology or any of the other sciences, uh, really. Um, uh, it could be anything from, you have an interest in field work. A lot of people, especially from a young age, are excited to be out in the field and doing field collecting and field observations. I was one, uh, though mine was in a different area at first. And um, I would just say, uh, ask a lot of questions, talk to ornithologists. I'm not an ornithologist myself. My background is mostly in invertebrate zoology. That's my graduate work. But uh, I love ecology and I love staying curious. And I'm just constantly asking questions about interactions between living things. and what makes them work and what we can do to support them. Uh, yeah, I love that, Marla. Mm -hmm. I love that curiosity. It is truly mm -hmm. the base of most of this. Um, I love your answer. I, the only thing I would say to add to that is um, consider volunteering. I am uh, pr pretty much can guarantee that New Jersey Audubon loves volunteers. Um, so there's a there's probably a local chapter that's really active in your community. Um, and Chris, I don't know if you know if there's anything specific that the lab is doing in terms of volunteer work in um, in New Jersey, but feel free to speak to that if you know something 
that's lab affiliated, but get involved with an organization in your local area that's doing bird walks, um, that's maybe doing outreach to local schools to get young people interested in birds. Um, as Marla alluded, I'm not 100% sure where this um, question, Deborah, it, it, in terms of where you're at professionally, if this is a career change or if you're still kind of um, exploring schools and so forth. But um, if you already are a professional, but you want to redirect, um, get involved with people that are passionate about birds and you'd be surprised where, where it might take you. The lab, for example, I know is, is hire, going to be hiring soon. Um, so, you know, some people get into birds here at the lab because they take a membership position. So maybe they love birds, but they have more of an organizational background. So they join us in a different department and then they kind of you know, work across departments and maybe end up in the citizen science wing eventually. So there's lots of options. And one of the coolest things about birds and being an ornithologist is anybody can do it. And I, the other kind of hat I wear at the lab is a historical citizen science project called Nest Quest Go. And all of those people were just documenting nesting birds on their property. They, they, were, they were scientists and they were doing this as a part of their hobby. And now we have their data and we're actually using it for science. So you don't need a degree. Anybody can do this. If you're, as Marla said, if you're curious and you're documenting, um, you're on your way. So you're not gonna what, share your um your aha moment where birds became it oh uh, i'm gonna share a funny aha moment i i i i uh, <laughs> i often become uncomfortable when anybody asks me my aha moment because i i i'm i had it in me from the earliest memories my parents did not encourage me they were biophobic i don't know where i came from some alien gene or something like that. But I was the kid who didn't want to play with any typical things that girls or even boys wanted to play with. I wanted to be outside all the time. I was always peering through the grass. I was always finding microscopic things. I was so fascinated in what was right under everyone's feet that they never noticed before. So I guess my spark moments came really early, just being outdoors and, and constantly asking questions and being curious and then running to the local library to see what is this I found and my favorite book was called life in a bucket of soil and just last year somebody said well why don't you find it again and I did and, and that was like and my spark moment comes more in finding other humans who are on the same wavelength as me because I was such an odd kid, I, I was bullied. I was, um, I didn't want to participate in anything that was with within this spectrum of, I don't know, I hate to say normal, but um, I wasn't into sports or anything, but I really loved nature. And my spark moment was, was uh, coming out of my shell, so to speak, because I was um, shy, awkward, uh not well socialized and then when i started to find friends who were into the same things it was aha <laughs> there's my tribe <laughs> these are my people so uh, you know I, I joined different uh volunteer organizations and uh volunteered at the nature center and, and things like that i want to put in one more plug though for uh what you could do uh whether you're young or older so there's something for everybody uh, about five, six years ago, I joined uh, Cornell has a really good master naturalist program and it's like summer camp for adults and we get together and we share knowledge about nature. We have professionals in to tell us about everything from entomology to botany to birds and there's always something to learn. So you put in volunteer hours and you um, uh you're just always learning it's just a way to keep learning so you can always contribute um but lots of retirees are in the master naturalist group thank you that's wow that was all great and becca your spark moment you didn't share it you want to share it so spark moment i love marla's that's um fabulous my uh, my son came to mind as you're talking um it is true how sort of we find our people when we find our people um i think my personal spark moment for birds specifically actually came when i was an edu an outdoor educator 
and I was teaching soon after I, I, I did a little bit when I was in college, but it was actually post-college when I started to do it as a career and I was taking kids on nature walks and birds were just a really easy hook for curiosity. Um, they saw them everywhere. They were fascinated by their colors, their shape, their movement. Um, and I just noticed how much ecology that I could teach through birds. Um, and then one very special and intense moment with birds that was, it's kind of an unusual spark. Usually sparks bring a lot of joy. This one brought a lot of, wow, that was powerful. Um, a Cooper's hawk swooped down when I was watching a um, acorn woodpecker with my students. I was teaching in California and pinned this acorn woodpecker to a tree um, and, and, and killed it and, and ate it. And um, the group was just like overwhelmed by this in action, you know, food web that they just experienced. And it is a food web. You know, that is one of the things when you watch nature, um, a lot of people don't want raptors at their bird feeders. And I totally understand it. Um, it, they, you know, there are bird eating birds out there, right? And Cooper's hawks are one of them. And so with this group, it was so powerful that we did sort of a debrief and we talked about that. We talked about death and how in natural systems, things eat each other. And, and a lot of the kids brought in some of their own personal stories. And again, it's just, I think birds are a very fascinating entry point for the natural world for people that maybe. Um, maybe are loosely paying attention or not paying attention at all. And then it can just be this deeper dive into understanding natural systems through birds. Wow, just, just wow, sorry. <laughs> I'm, I'm envisioning, you know, that, that whole experience, wow. Um, so another question here, and I know we're, we're close to our time, but I have two more questions. Um, I have an eight room birdhouse that needs to be replaced. A woodpecker drilled holes in the roof. Birds have lived there for three years and they won't move out. How should I evict them to install a new replacement birdhouse? They love the pollinator garden underneath it. Wow, that's fun. So they're using it year round. That's unusual, actually. Um, usually birds will move in and, you know, do their rearing of young and then move out. Um, Marla, please interject and let me know if you have another uh, point of feedback, but I would encourage you to uh, clean it out after you're 100% sure there's no more nesting going on. And so depending on the species that are inhabiting this house, um, my hunch would be that's gonna be sometime in September to be 100% safe. Um, so go in there and get, get access to it, clean out anything that's in there. And actually people that we encourage people to put nest boxes in and that's, we encourage people to clean out nest boxes every year. You could do it in September. You could also wait and do it in the spring, like in February, uh, maybe even late January and clean it out. Um, if you clean out the detritus and the things that they might be using, there's a good chance that they will at least leave it alone for a little while. They might come back. Um, and then it, replace it at that point, take it down, replace it, put something else in. Now I will say it's not a bad thing that you are providing shelter to birds. So, you know, they might be bothersome. Maybe they're creating, um, you know, if it's a starling, for example, that's not native and, and they're um, taking away habitat from some of the native birds you're trying to encourage. That's a little bit of a different story, but if you're, if they're literally, you know, juncos, chickadees, nuthatches, cavity nesting birds that are using that space, you know, good for you. You're creating some kind of a protective shelter that they're drawn to. Thank you. That's great, great information. Um, so here, it looks like we are down to the final question and good because it's almost time. Uh, is there a balance that we should have in a good habitat for birds? Numbers of native plants, water, is there some kind of a natural balance we should have? Oh. I can start to answer. Um, uh, research from Doug Tallamy and Desiree Narango have come to uh, suggest that um, it's it, is it seventy percent. Seventy percent natives are the minimum threshold that will support birds as uh, uh, to encourage birds to use what you've got. Um, so they, um, you know. Uh, um, some people need a more gradual approach. We have stuff in our yards that may have been here for decades that is not native. 
And we want to uh, encourage everybody to understand um, a gentle approach is best for yourself. You don't have to go and remove all your in invasives right away, or at least your non-natives. We've got some really nasty invasives. <laughs> that takes a lot of work, but they're better gone. Um, but uh, so, you know, at least that many. Uh, and um, being that it's a process, give yourself time to add them gradually. So every time you add something, you're, you just feel good about it. Give yourself a pat on the back. You've added some native plants in. And over time, you can gradually replace your non-natives and see the difference. It, it's, you're going to see it. The proof is going to be there by the brevisitors that use your, your space. Anything else, Becca? No, that was perfect. You guys were amazing. This was just really, really wonderful. I, um, I assume Chris wants to wrap things up, but I, I just want to say thank you so much. Very good, Happy. thanks. I'll, Very um, well. I'll, as, I, as I get ready to wrap it up, I'll just answer a couple of questions that were, or that uh, Becca had invited me to say a couple of things. We, um, uh, for people who are young birders who are interested in being involved, there is a Young Birders Network uh, at uh, the Lab of Ornithology. And there are also a lot of different, if you look at the K to 12 section of our site, lots of different activities that you can do with your kids um, and with scout troops and other things. Um, and then also the, the question about what can you do in New Jersey? We, it's true, Audubon is much more involved on the ground. There are local chapters. Being involved with the lab is really some of the things that were hit on uh, here. It's being a citizen scientist. It's using the Merlin bird ID uh, using eBird and, and helping add to our database of, of birds who are in your area and helping with science in that way. Uh, Nest Watch, Feeder Watch, other programs like that. Um, so I just wanted to mention those things. So uh, again, birds.cornell.edu is our website. And uh, we, any of these things that I mentioned are free. Um, but we, of course, appreciate people joining as members to support a lot of the great work we do. And uh, they, the memberships are very, um, are very reasonable entry, entry level, and you'll receive the Living Bird magazine and other, other uh, publications. So I uh, just want to thank uh, the panelists, thank Debbie for this idea, uh, thank, Lisa for, uh, thank Lisa for the idea, thank Debbie for the collaboration, and uh, hope you all have a great afternoon and uh, a rest the rest of the early summer. Thank you all so much. And we will have a recording available to those who participated. So thank you again. Thank you. It's a pleasure. Bye. Bye-bye.